talk about tibial plateau fractures. The objectives are to describe initial evaluation and management of tibial plateau fractures, identify common fracture patterns, apply treatment principles and strategies, and discuss rehab complications and outcome. First, we'll go through the initial management of plateau fractures. Tibial plateau tire fractures are 1% to 2% of all fractures. They have a similar bimodal distribution to many periarticular fractures, where we see 70% in young adult men with an average age in the mid-40s. And then, obviously, the much higher energy um, fracture patterns as well. The middle-aged ones and elderly are usually simple falls, often have a split depressed pattern, uh, less commonly an isolated medial plateau fracture versus the higher energy sports related injuries, which can often be splits and associated ligamentous injuries. And then the category of the high energy motor vehicle accident, fall from height or pedestrian struck. These are often the more complex fracture patterns, bicondylar, often younger patients and at high risk for neurovascular injury. These are also much more common open fractures that can develop compartment syndrome. The initial presentation, the mechanism obviously matters. The lower energy fractures seen on the left are usually a simple fall or patient struck from the side where they have a simple, usually lateral plateau fracture and tend to be length stable versus the higher energy injury on the right, which is often more of an axial load, can have different patterns of shearing and there's often compartment syndrome associated with these. Now, the initial management, like any fractures, physical exam, we're looking for swelling, particularly for compartment syndrome and the high energy ones, looking for pulses. Any instability is important as well to determine how severe the fracture is or if it needs to be fixed. You know, we splint them pretty quickly in a knee immobilizer, but often uh, need to do frequent compartment checks. And if they're not going to the OR right away, or even if they are, we have to start thinking about DVT prophylaxis. Imaging, if you have it, a CT scan is uh, obviously beneficial. Plain films are, are important and critical. Uh, as we get more down the road on imaging, MRI can be helpful for occult fractures uh, and also ligamentous injuries when you see the fracture dislocation patterns. We'll look at the uh, common fracture patterns next. I think everyone probably is familiar with the Schatzker classification, type one through six, with increasing severity of injury. Type one is the simple split. Type two, the more common one we see is a split depressed pattern. Type three is an isolated depression. Type four swings over to the medial side with the lateral side still intact. The type five is a bicondylar and a six is with no connection between the metaphysis and the joint. Again, these are the higher energy ones, the five and the six. Younger patients often have better quote, uh, bone quality, whereas the higher energy with associated depression of the lateral chondral surface is relatively easier to fix in these younger patients. As the bone quality gets more poor in the elderly, it can become more common. The type one, two, and three are the most common ones that we see. There's also the medial as we get into the type four shots curve. There's the low energy elderly patient that may have a simple medial depression caused by a varus loading and the fracture exits medial to the spine. This one on the left is a relatively straightforward pattern to take care of. Whereas as they get higher energy with medial shearing, they become higher risk for vascular injuries. And these are essentially a fracture dislocation variant where the actual knee can be more dislocated as the energy increases. The bicondylar tibial plateaus, the fives and the sixes, typically are higher energy. Always think of compartment syndrome as a risk factor here. Always do a thorough neuro exam here and a vascular exam. These are commonly open. There's also an OTA classification which is a bit more simpler, which is more of a uniform classification, often used for research, which is simply extra articular as a type A, partial articular would be a B, and a complete articular would be a type C OTA fracture pattern. 
Now, the important variance with the uh, open injuries, they can be challenges for coverage, obviously, with plastic surgery, often needed with degloving injuries, particularly proximally. They often have shaft extension and certainly mm -hmm. early coverage, if possible, within 72 hours, just like any open fracture, can decrease the late infection rate. Now, the fracture dislocation patterns are the next uh, type, which is very high energy, often associated with shortening and medial displacement. There are a lot of vascular injuries here. You also have to be concerned for subluxation through the fracture. These don't always seem to fit a Schatzker classification, as you can see on the CT scan on the right with a posterior shear. It doesn't really fit into Schatzker's classification. You can see it coming close to the posterior vessels, these are high energy shear injuries that need to be addressed uh, very carefully. These are often posterior medial patterns, these shears, they're like a B-type fracture, a partial articular. They can also be associated with bicondylar patterns as well. So you do need, if you can get a CT scan to look at these patterns and see where the shear is, to see if it's a posterior shear versus a medial shear. This brought up sort of the three column concept of plateau fractures, where you have a medial column as well as a lateral column and then the posterior column. And this is important to consider this when you're trying to figure out the best approach to fixing these fractures. Next, we'll talk about treatment principles and strategies. So the fracture location and classification generally dictate the approach. So the most common anterior lateral uh, fracture pattern is usually done through an anterior lateral approach, whereas the posterior medial or more commonly the medial uh, fracture fragment has gone through a direct medial approach. The key is to visualize the fracture and see the articular surface. This is especially common with the lateral depressions where we like to make a submeniscal arthrotomy, really look at the joint surface, make sure you're getting it back to its normal position before fixing this. Arthroscopically is an option. We really don't do that much in trauma, but if you have the tools, you could certainly try this, but more so we're looking directly at the joint surface. If you're having any issues with equipment or swelling in the skin, a temporary external fixator is definitely a very uh, important tool to use. It also helps hold these fractures out to length while you're waiting for the skin swelling to get better so you can fix them. As we decide non-operative treatment options, generally undisplaced or minimally displaced fractures are amenable to non-operative treatment. Small depressions of the lateral plateau without any major deformity or instability on exam. Obviously, if they have significant medical comorbidities, they're elderly with low functional demands, we may accept a bit more deformity. Now, the real relative contraindications are knee instability, particularly with valgus stress, there's often a greater displacement with stress and also medial sided injuries are very hard to treat non-operatively because they tend to go into varus. So here's an example of a non-operative management plateau. You can see it's a small split with maybe a, a little bit of depression in it. It would be quite hard to get this fracture much better with operative intervention. Some of these very small shears, almost avulsions of the PCL, again, very hard to get this much better operatively, allow these to heal on their own, get people to start early range of motion, limit their weight bearing for eight to 12 weeks. As long as the uh, angular alignment is okay, these generally do quite well. Now, the goals of surgical fixation are really to restore the alignment. This is the most important uh, factor of tibial plateau fracture in addition to um, having a fully stable knee and a congruent articular surface. So the most common tibial plateau fracture is the lateral plateau. The key steps, as I mentioned earlier, is the submeniscal arthrotomy. Really try to get underneath the meniscus so you can see the articular surface. Try to hold this reduced uh, with K-wires temporarily while you're looking at it. There's often a void that's present after you've elevated the joint surface and we need to try to fill, fill a void if you have these available. Certainly cancellous chips um, 
is an option. Iliac crest bone graft would be another option for a very large defect. And if you have some of the calcium phosphate cements, these uh, are ideal. Also apply rafting screws in the lateral plateau, trying to hold that joint surface up. Here's an example of a 48 year old woman who fell off a scooter. You can see here on the AP, there's a joint surface is depressed down here. It's often best to see this on the lateral where you can really see where the piece is. As we blow this up, you can see the large depression here that we need to try to get back to normal. Here's a CT scan uh, that obviously shows the similar pattern. Here we try to elevate the joint surface, hold it temporarily reduced with K wires, and then apply rafting screws on a lateral plate. Postoperatively, same idea, you want to uh, get early range of motion um, and keep them to limit their weight bearing for eight to 12 weeks. Isolated medial injuries, on the other hand, much less common, usually a posterior or posterior medial approach to try to get a plate either on the medial side or a posterior medial as needed. We tend to be able to do these supine. Uh, it's more of the posterior shears that you really need to place them prone to try to get full access to the posterior aspect of the proximal tibia. The idea of fixing these is you really want to prevent late varus collapse, which as you can see, these can displace and go into varus if they're not held into proper position. And here's an example of a posterior medial VT scan where you want to try to get a plate up into the medial side to hold this reduced and buttressed. Here's an example of one that was a done more of a posterior medial done prone uh, where you can see reducing the fracture, placing K wires, and then using a buttress plate. You don't need a locked plate here. You just need a buttress against the deformity to hold this reduced. As the injuries get more complex, the bicondylar tibial plateaus, uh, external fixator can certainly be an important part of these to help with your reduction. As you do pull on them out to length on an external fixator, do be aware that you can increase compartment pressure. So again, the, uh, the approaches, um, you can do a true prone approach and go in posteriorly and bring a limb in the back of the knee so you can get across, uh, all the way across from the medial side to the lateral side and hold this fragment reduced with a posterior plate, knowing that you will also have to go anterior lateral as well. Just be wary of the neurovascular structures when you're going across from the medial side, stay right on the bone to protect these. Here's an example of a posterior approach, again done prone, uh, where you can see the posterior fragment is now reduced, mostly with non-locking screws to buttress this back in place. Then you'll have to flip the patient supine and do the anterolateral approach. Here's an example of that fixation following uh, the posterior approach. The big question is on the medial side is which way do you want to go? Do you go posterior and do a posterior buttress or is it more of a medial uh, pattern where you can uh, plate these, excuse me, directly medially? Uh, if you can get an axial CT scan, this can be very helpful uh, to decide if you want to do a medial approach versus a posterior approach to decide where you need to best get your plate. Here's another uh, example of a patient that was a high energy bicondylar tibial plateau fracture. Four compartment fasciitis required. Here they are in their external fixator. It gives you some time to figure out where you need to put your plates. This is a complex, we'll need bicondylar plating here. And a lot of the deformity is here on the medial side. So this one was fixed with a, you know, a medial plate or almost posterior medial trying to buttress this back up and then going through the lateral side as well. The key here, getting the joint surface reduced and maintaining overall alignment. Now, if the fracture extends into the tibial shaft, um, often we can do a bridge plating technique or fix the joint surface. And as further down, you can consider doing an IM nail an example like this where a patient has a complex proximal tibia and a distal tibia. Here you first focus on the proximal tibia aspect of the fracture, getting the joint surface 
as reduced as possible with plates. And then you can try to do an IM nail to address the distal fracture. And here you can see fractures of the joint surface, obviously not perfect, but the alignment is what is key here. The last one to talk about is the bicondylar plateau, like the hyperextension mechanism we see. This is a, a large depression of the anterior slope here with a hyperextension type injury. These are very difficult fracture patterns, very high risk for neurovascular injury. So be aware of this pattern when you see this, especially on the lateral view. Again, putting a external fixator on can certainly help things and pull it out to length and get a, a better idea of what you're dealing with. And then try to figure out where you want to approach this both medial and laterally. Here you can see an anterior or more medial incision was made to elevate the joint surface, get it back into a good position, often temporarily holding this with K wires even into the medial femoral condyle and then applying both medial and lateral plates. Finally, we'll talk about rehab and complications and outcome. The main goal of the surgery is to allow range of motion as quickly as possible. Sometimes it's harder if they have a tubercle fracture, but for a joint surface that's been reconstructed with an intact extensor mechanism, we like to try to get them moving right away. Unlocked hinge knee brace if you have one. Keep them off of this for at least eight weeks. Sometimes uh, I'll judge it on pain once they're at eight weeks. If they can touch down to a partial weight without a lot of pain, I may let them start uh, putting more weight on it at about eight weeks. Really working on quad strengthening as well. The biggest complications that we see um, often can be uh, infections, obviously, with these open fractures, the Schatzker sixes. Medial plating um, not done can often have some varus collapse. And the most important thing is the alignment overall, that if you have them aligned in the OR, uh, long-term outcomes are definitely going to be better. Obviously, loss of uh, reduction and some arthritis is certainly common and joint stiffness, um, as well as prominent painful hardware, which we often take out. So in conclusion, a systemic approach to initial presentation, really paying attention to neurovascular exam, uh, considering compartment syndrome, um, operative goals, axial alignment, making sure you have condylar width and joint congruity while you're addressing the alignment. And the key steps really is to plan the approach, really look at the x-rays carefully and try to decide if you need to go medial, posterior, or just lateral, or any combination of the above. Thank you very much.